Lord, I thank you for this time we have, the uh, the 20 or so minutes that we have um, to dive into your word. I just pray uh, your anointing on myself for speaking. I pray for your anointing for everyone here to be able to hear. And uh, that Holy Spirit, just invite you to just flood the place, and open our hearts and minds, and speak to each one of us uh, on, on the specific aspects that you're wanting to speak to us in tonight's message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're talking about the, the Jonah and the, the city of Nineveh. Uh, the, the city of Nineveh, I heard two different accounts. One said that it was about 150. Another said it was over 600,000. The 600,000 makes a little more sense because it was kind of like the capital of the world at the time. Uh, so the 600,000 makes a little more sense as far as size-wise. So we have, let's just say, you know, close to a million or over half a million at that point people living in wickedness. Like I read about I read up like the story and to me it kind of makes me think of like San Francisco without all the passivity. So like if San Francisco had like LA's anger, that's what I think of as like like Nineveh, right? Like they were into everything bad. They were they you know the murders, they they had all kinds of stuff. And God, you know, wants to send his prophet and obviously his prophet, you know, doesn't really like that. It has a little bit of an issue. So here's the thing. It's a lot of times we think of this story, it's kind of easy to jump over because there's not really someone easy to relate to. Like we have this big evil city and we have this prophet that kind of seems like a jerk and kind of seems like, yes, yeah, God's just going to strike this guy down any minute. But something that God really spoke to me on as I was preparing all this stuff and running around getting this stuff together and um, I kind of hadn't really spent a ton of time yet going to scripture. And I was kind of thinking about it, and it, God just kind of like hit. It kind of hit me, and it was like, okay, look, like we are Nineveh, and so it's easy to, to think of Nineveh as like the bad city, right? Like they are this horrible city, and they're rebelling against God, and they're doing their own thing, and they're sinners, and God's gonna wipe them out, like literally going to just wipe them off the face of the earth. However he does it, he's, he did it with Sodom and Gomorrah by giant hailstones falling down and just pulverizing everything. So they're like about ready to be like just destroyed because of their wickedness. And like God really spoke to me, it was like, we are Nineveh. Like we are sinners. Like we have the same thing. God has set up his law. He's set up, obviously we're in the new covenant, but like God has his thing. We go off and we do our own thing. We're you know, selfish, we're greedy. Now, we may not seem as evil as Nineveh because, like, Austin's never killed anyone yet. Uh, yeah. uh, you passed your background check, so I think you're good. Uh, you know, like, there's certain things it's easy to, like, we always make ourselves out to be the hero, right? We read the Bible and we think of the hero, and that's why we have a hard time relating to Jonah because there's no obvious hero, but God's the hero in the story, and we're the villain. We're the one who, we, we relate to the sinful city. Yeah. So, let's go over this really quick. So Nineveh was wicked, yes, but here's the thing, we live in America, and America, if you look at it, is actually, has much more evil and much more, like, they didn't have, like, we've invented amazing types of evil compared to them, like, we perfected it. So a lot of times it's easy to look back of, like, the weakness of the Bible, but we're much worse. Like, they didn't have, like, yes, there was stuff, they had... Um, you know, murder and orgies, and they had abortion, yeah. well, killing babies, they didn't have abortion so much as, like, actually just killing what, what Donald Trump recently called her, and not letting um, infants being born at nine months from their mother's womb. Uh, so we had, like, they had stuff, like, I'm not saying, like, oh, it was perfect back then, but we've taken it to a new level, so it's easy to say, oh, Nineveh was bad, but what would have been, minus a few things, like, murder and a couple of things, like, what Nineveh, like, was an example of being evil is what we just call okay nowadays. Okay. So we look at a lot of these old cities, even Sodom and Gomorrah. The number one thing, there was a lot of things, but the number one thing Sodom and Gomorrah had against it was their idolatry. And the main form that it came out was in homosexuality, bestiality, basically um, sexual perversion was their main. They set up their own desire and their own way above God and God's plan. And it came out mostly through sexual perversion. Okay. Um, there was some murder and other stuff that went along with that. Uh, but that was like their main thing. But we don't consider that evil nowadays. Be Sally still in most yeah, places. So but like <laughs> the whole other list, like it, it's, we're in a time where it's not near as important. Can you have him sit down? He's blocking the camera. Oh, sorry. Um, sit down. Where a lot of the stuff that a lot of these wicked cities were 
like judge as wicked for, we don't even call wicked anymore. Like we only hold a few things as being like super wicked. We like delight as a nation. I mean us as this room specifically in a lot of uh, perversion. So, uh, you know, whatever that we have more. Um, so here's the thing. It's easy to think of like, oh, America, but a lot of what I'm talking about is even in the church. So whoever has the first scripture, 2 Corinthians 11, 2 through 3. Go ahead and read that. Throw it away in the trash can. Well, I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself. I promised you a pure fly to one husband, Christ. Christ. But I feel that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted, just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent. Serpent. Okay. So he's writing to the Corinthian church, um, Paul's writing, and he's kind of condemning them in the fact of that they've been deceived, they've been corrupted, and this isn't a city, this isn't a wicked nation, this is this is the church, that they've let stuff in, they've been deceived, and they have um, sinned. There's, Paul sends out several letters to several different churches, and then again there's some stuff in Revelation about the different churches, about judgment, and a lot of them had a lot of stuff going for them. And they, they go through different things, but at the same time, they all had some rebuke. <clears throat> they all had something that like God had against them. And they all kind of boil down to they got lax in an area and they let areas of culture and they let areas of just human nature come in and they, they kind of just allowed it and it became normal in church. And we can see that over the years that's happened with more and more stuff. The one I think about, like, going back to furthest, like, back when we would think of, like, churches being still more holy and whatnot, um, one of the first ones that I can think, well, no, let's go back even further, uh, one of the first ones I really let in, this has been a struggle since the beginning, is racism. Like, you go back even to, like, the early, the beginning um, churches uh, of, like, let's say a few generations ago, they didn't even consider that, like, that wasn't even a question. I wasn't even going to go into that, but, like, that was a whole one. The one that I first came to my mind, though, is uh, just a couple generations ago, back, back when, like, some of the older, older, 80, 90-year-olds in church were younger. That generation had no issue with gossip. Like, that wasn't something the church preached about. And I've talked about this in youth a long time ago, how it's like, that, that was the generation where they're like, oh, you can't you know, go to movies, it's, it's evil. Uh, you heard, so most of you heard me say, jokingly, the whole, don't smoke, chew, or go with girls who do. That was something they said back then. That was kind of a joke, but also it was, it was serious. They had this form of like holiness. You know, they dressed very modest. They didn't go to movies. They didn't go to bowling alleys. There's a lot of things, I know we've joked about that. There's a lot of things that were like just considered their religious things you didn't do because... They were just religiously not good, but they had no problem gossiping. That was a known thing. Like the the, the women get together, they had a, I can't think of the name of it, the, but they would all work on crochet together. So there'd literally be a group of women would get together. And I was just picking on women. Men had their own thing, but this is the one that comes to my mind like the most because of like I've heard the most crazy stories about it. So they get together and have like a sewing circle type thing, but they weren't sewing. They would be and they'd all crochet together. Working on like a big blanket type thing, and just around yeah, gossip. Just gossip. That's all. That's all I have to say. Exactly. Yeah. And there was no. <laughs> that's what we call fishing. Huh? <laughs> yeah. See, I said, said men have their own have version. Their own. Guys have their own version. Um, and it, I gotta turn that off once. And they have like they, that was not really something that was preached on. So like a preacher would get up and condemn you for like yeah. seeing a movie or even like a lot of different things oh. that like we. There's nothing in the Bible. Now, yes, you can you can. That's really annoying. Uh, I'll throw it out the window. Go throw it away. So every every generation's had stuff like that, but now it, it's to an extreme. I remember when I was a kid, uh, and the first beginnings of like certain churches um, switching over to like homosexuality and having homosexual preachers and having having different things like that. And so it, it, it's crept in. And so just like, you know, Paul's talking to the Corinthians you. there. He's saying, I ha you know, like I have this against you. He, in some of his letters, is you've strayed away in certain areas. And you've allowed things to creep in. And so just like Nineveh, Nineveh didn't just start off. They didn't say, guys, we're going to charter the next greatest evil city. It's not like, like the DreamWorks movies where it's like, oh, I'm going to be the greatest villain of all time. Let's go build a lair. It's like not how they started off. In fact, at the end of the story, they repent. They repent. 
But a couple generations later, a few generations, about 600 years later, they go back and were even more wicked than before. And they actually do. I don't think we're going to have time to get to it, but the Nahum, the book of Nahum, is all... I was going to say, mine's real cheery. That, yeah, yours is. <laughs> Brandy's, that when Nahum, the prophet Nahum, is basically what Jonah wanted to be. So Jonah brought a message of repent. God said, go tell them to like repent. Nahum is basically like, look, you have gone back to your old ways. You were more sinful before. And the city was utterly destroyed. The, another king came against them, and he was killed. The city was completely destroyed. A lot of the, the stuff, the city was even like hidden and buried. It wasn't until the 1800s. So in like the city, the, the city fell in like 600 and something BC. It wasn't until the 1800s. So do the math there. It wasn't until the 1800s that like archaeologists even like dug it up and found some of it. So it, it spent like a couple thousand years, give or take, buried and hidden, which is detailed in the prophecy of Nahum about how it was going to be taken out. So. We have to be careful because it's human nature to stray from God. Time and time again, like you got Israel, God's chosen people, constantly. In the presence of God, they had the temple. God's presence would come down in the temple. And they still, they would, were, and they saw miracles and all these kind of things, and they kept straying. The disciples spent three years with Jesus, and they all ran. Peter, like the rock. Nope denied them three times so it's it's human nature if we're not on guard that's why the, the, Bible, the scripture talks about one it's in one of these let me see um it talks about pick up your cross daily it talks about living with the spirit it talks about crucifying the flesh um which is another cross reference and so it's this concept of if we're not every single day like how many of you with the exception of extreme situations how many of you like eat every day, right? Oh. Like at least yeah, once. Yeah, yeah. Most of the time we do it several times a day. So that makes sense, right? Because what happens is if we don't eat, we start to feel the pain of it, right? We start, it starts with hunger, irritability. We got that whole hangry thing. Um, it, it'll get, start to get painful. If you go long enough, it, some people it can be a couple hours. They feel like they're dying. But you start to go a couple days, you start to feel death coming on. Like the cows. Hashtag like the cows. Hashtag goals. You start to feel the pain. You start to feel the death coming on. And you, you stop that by eating. And you satisfy that need. As Christians, it's supposed to be the same way. So the problem is so many times, like we can become so spiritually deadened where it's like, we're not even aware of that. We're not even so we can go days and months and and well, I should have said weeks first and uh, forever, and we just don't have any kind of experience. We're not having any kind of relationship with God, and it's easy to to see ourselves as still being righteous and holy because you know we come to church and we're good and we're the good kids and we're not involved in the same thing. And there's a lot of kids out there who used to go, you know, used to be we used to know, and they're out there and they're doing drugs and they're in prison and they're getting their girlfriends pregnant or they're getting pregnant, they're this and that. It's easy to like compare ourselves to others and go, yeah, we're pretty good. But that would be like looking at someone who ate poison and they're like writhing in pain and dying from poison and go, I haven't eaten in, in 28 days, but I'm good because I'm not like that guy. I didn't, I didn't accidentally drink battery acid. Like, so I'm good. No, you're a few days away from dying of starvation. Uh, you know, it, it, you just, by comparison, yes, you're doing better, but that doesn't change the fact that you haven't eaten in a month and you're getting close, like death is getting closer. You, you, you're losing, your body's shutting down. You need to eat. Like you're, you're in dire, a dire situation. Thing is, because we don't, to dying spiritually, we can keep going, right? Like we don't die spiritually and then go and like just drop down dead. We don't start to feel as much, and so it's easy to slowly get away from that. But um, who has Amos? Hi. Um, get yours ready. Amos um, uh, 2, verse 4, and we'll get to that in just a second. Um, the Bible is very specific, though, about how, about righteousness and about living the Christian life. And a lot of times we just get away from that, even in church, even growing up and living in church our entire life. And then we can hear a message or we can read a, a Bible passage, and it's like, does our life even look like that at all? Go ahead and read Amos. This is what the Lord says. For three sons of Judah, even for four, I will not relent, because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not 
kept his degree because they have been led astray by false gods, the gods their ancestors followed. Okay, so it's easy to glaze over those verses and ignore them because it kind of doesn't sound like it applies to us because we're not going to go off and, and like worship Baal and, and all these things, right? And it's like the astroth pole, which is weird stuff. Like sometimes is I Baal worship still a thing in some places. Is what? Baal worship still a thing. In some places. Yeah, it's not very it's common, not. but I've from my brother there are a few places. Um, one of their main ways of worshiping, by the way, is sacrificing their children. So uh, okay. good luck with that. Um, it's easy to gloss over that. I mean, how many of you here have ever like actively like gone and worshipped like at a pagan altar or a temple what? or anything? Anyone? Yeah. See, so it's easy to go. Oh, not talking to me. Never done that. Never gonna do that. I don't even eat at half the Chinese restaurants in town because they have that little Buddha shrine thing. So I don't, we don't even eat at those restaurants. Like we're good. We're Christian folk over here. But here's the thing. <clears throat> those aren't the only forms of idols. Like Satan's pretty smart. Like I don't like giving the, the dude credit, but he, he's pretty intelligent. He's not going to be like see, the county of Henrico is setting up a bell worship, and we, you know, we, you, you're gonna, you know, gotta start trying to follow. Like, it's not gonna happen. He's not gonna do that because it's, it's not gonna work. What happens is he starts to set up other idols in our lives. Stuff that we put anything we put before God is a form of idolatry. So even good things can be like, for example. Working out is good, and eating healthy is good, but you that can become an idol. Yeah, it, it, I don't let that. What? Don't let eating good or working out become yeah. an idol. You're like, oh, I'm not. Don't so worry I'm, about that. You're just going to avoid it all together. You're talking to me on that one. There are people who, you're like, right? I ha there's people who legitimately, like, their excuse for why they wouldn't go to church or don't go as much. or as, They've got to work out. they got their stuff to do. they got, um, oh, we got a marathon. Oh, uh, we got that Henrico bike ride thing coming up. You know, there's always something they're, they're training for, they're doing. So something good like that can be, we can get, uh, money is a big one. We put money before, oh, I gotta work. I gotta work. There was a time to where, well, first off, there's a time where businesses wouldn't even be open on Sunday. But you wouldn't have taken a job. As, like, here's the thing. How many of you would take a job that caused you to, like, very obviously compromise your faith? Let's just go, well, uh, we've switched our demographic. I can't go with what we talked about two, or two weeks ago. What's that? I know. Um, we got munchkins. No, I'm just kidding. You're not munchkins. Um, let's see. Oh, here we go. A, a better version of that. How many of you would get, I know, just pretend you're older. How many of you would get a job serving alcohol? And some of you may not matter. You may not, it may not conscience. Okay. How many of you would get a job where it required you to get drunk? Okay, so that would be a red, that'd be a, 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 a flag for you, and you would say, nope, I'm calling a foul. I'm not going to get a job that requires me to basically be drunk all the time. How many of you would work for the government in a position, not military, but like government assassin type thing, where you have to actually basically murder people? Not like, oh, we're in a war and it's covered, like that's different, that's a whole other thing. But like, no, you're like a CIA assassin, where you're like legit just like sniping people in the back of the head, just like murdering people, just, you don't even know why. Like. Anyone have a moral obligation with that? Like anyone here would like, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't want to do that. Yeah, okay, so that's a line. Well, there was a time where, and there still are people, but there's a time where even as a society, working on a Sunday would have also been a red line, right? So that's one way. We can put money, we can put work as an idol. Where now we're like, oh, I, oh man, we haven't seen him forever. Yeah, I've been busy, I gotta do shit. I hear this all the time, even from kids and youth. Yeah, I haven't, oh yeah, I haven't been around, I've been really busy with work, they put me on another another shift. And if you push deeper, it's like, well, why? Actually, this is what, about two, a year and a half ago we had this happen. We lost like six or seven youth students, older youth students because they started getting jobs and they, and they started getting put on schedules where they couldn't come on Sundays or Wednesdays anymore. And it was like, Okay, so what that's clearly saying is that these things are more important. And everyone has priorities and everyone has their things. And so that can become, I'm not saying, look, here, I understand there's circumstances. There's times where, you know, there's a single mom and you, that's the only, you got to take, you got to deal with, there's, I'm not, I'm not trying to make a blanket statement and condemn here. But overall, you know, we start to make priorities and it, that's how we can get in these situations where we can get in these idle situations. I won't go into it, but um, some people make football an idol. How many grown men don't come to church because games play and DVR and it's not the same. Like, that's a legit thing. Like, people don't come to church because the game and watching it later is not the same. Which I understand it's not the same, so I'm not trying to say they're being stupid with that. It's just that they're putting that above. 
Like, no, Monday night football, Thursday night football uh -huh. no. isn't enough. Like, no. Sunday football, like, it doesn't okay. matter that there's football, like, four nights a week. Get out. I have to watch Sunday, and it's during church, so I can't go. People make that an idol, and there's lots of things. Sports can get in. I'll pick on sports you for a little bit. You knew it was Monday night and Thursday night football. Yeah, I'm not dumb. I just don't like it. <laughs> so, they... Remember, I'm a pretend Jets fan, which means nothing. Uh, here's a, here's a, sports, a, a more common way, and that was more of an excuse back in the day. Um, now it's a little more flexible, but you know, back when it was more, mostly Sunday, there wasn't all this Monday night, all this other stuff, when football was just kind of a sport, and wasn't like such a marketed, they're like the man's version of Hallmark, right? They'll just stick a marketing thing yes. on anything and put products out there. Yes. Um, that was That's actually that's really eerily good. accurate, now that I think about it. But the anyways. The official tire of the NFL. <laughs> yeah. So, um, a more common way for sports, and I watched this I watched this bring my sister down, and she'll, she was say to your face, she's agreed with me, and she said, yeah, it was the worst thing my parents could have done was not stopping me. She got we teaching, involved. We were at church involved first. We were starting to teach missionettes together. You and Jessica? Yeah. Okay. I didn't, I didn't remember that part. But she got really involved in sports to the point where um, it drug her and my parents out of church because they were doing sports. They were in, they would, had away games, they had this, and it became such a big thing. Um, I want to wrap up really quick, guys. Bye, yeah. Carter. Bye, Carter. See you tomorrow. Um, and so I'm gonna, I'll am i wrap up with this because I know we're out of time. Uh, it became such a big thing that it got to the point where it wasn't just my sister missing, but my mom and my dad, it got to the point where none of them were going to church consistently, which caused them to get out of church, which then caused them to get in this loop of, oh, well, now we're looking for a new church, which was like, oh, well. And, they came to sing, and my parents were out of church for like a year, year and a half, something like that. My sister got so far down because one thing can lead to another, can lead to another. She went from, okay, church is no longer, and youth and church is no longer a priority, so therefore I'm no longer hanging out with my Christian friends, which means I'm spending more time with my non-Christian friends at school. They influenced her. She got into drinking. She started lying to my parents. She got into a bit rebellious type stuff. Rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. So when you get into dark stuff, it opened up the doors, and she started having demonic issues. It got to the point where she couldn't sleep at night because demons would visit her and would taunt her, and she couldn't sleep. Uh, and, and at one point, I remember she was so tired and, and just so scared and so tired of it, she couldn't handle it anymore. I remember she came, and I, it actually scared me because like, I woke up, and she's like jumping in my bed. I'm like, what are you doing? And she's like, they won't leave me alone, and I know they won't follow me in here. And so she came, and she's like, can I just sleep next to your bed? And I'm like, sure. <laughs> and I was like, still have to sleep. And I'm like... Just, I per just in case, I'm glad that you're confident that they won't come in here because it's my room, but... <laughs> I've got my Bible. I suck my Bible like it's a teddy bear. Just in case. Just in case, right? So, we, the whole point of this is we can... In the story, and I say we are Nineveh, we can easily stray off. At our best, the Bible says our righteousness is filthy rags. So on our best day... We're basically the evil city of the villain of the story. It's God and his love and his compassion and his mercy sending his son to die on the cross for us. That is what redeems us. That is what sanctifies us. It's not because we come to church and we become good people and we go to and we get to heaven and when we're judged and we're like the book is opened and everything we've ever done, said, thought, not done or said, or everything basically is laid out. It's not that because we surround ourselves in a Christian youth group and we have Christian friends and we have Christian parents and we do the right thing that we, we balance out like a checkbook. Yeah, there's some withdrawals, but there's enough positives that we, we win, we get through. Our righteousness is like filthy rags. It's that when we go and that book is opened, that after all that judging is done, when we're being sentenced, that is wiped away. It, it's Christ's life that's looked at. And he's perfect. So it's the fact that we don't even have to. It's not our final score for the test. It, it, so again, back to the story. It's God's love. He's the hero of the story. God's the one that comes in and saves us and redeems us. But like Nineveh, we have to, one, we have to respond. And we can't just go. You, can't, you couldn't have been a foreigner and go like, I'm going to move to Nineveh. God's blessing them. They repented. I'm going to still live my way. But I live in, it doesn't work like that. Like we actually have to, that's the number one thing is we, we have to respond and repent and turn away from our sins. And two, we have to do the opposite of Nineveh and not go back on it. So we can't just come to church, 
get saved or say some, say a word, some prayer or have good attendance, and that carry us our whole life. It, it's a constant thing. Just like I can't be a great guy, get Brandon to marry me, be awesome for the first year of our marriage, and then go run around with whoever I want to. And like be gone all the time because me and the boys, we want to go to Vegas and hang out. And then, oh, sorry, hey, I know we were going to have date night tonight, but actually Cindy's back in town. So, no, I would have said Atlantic City. Like, I'm, I'm thinking West Coast still. Like, oh, Cindy's back in town. Remember the, the, the cheerleader girl? This is made up. I didn't date a Cindy. I never dated a cheerleader. Like, from, from, you know, from high school, she's back in town. Like, I'm going to go spend the weekend with her. I'll make it up to you. We'll do, like, that wouldn't work, right? Like, we wouldn't be married for very long. And if we... Were, if she didn't divorce me, there'd definitely be like death. Like she'd kill me, I'm pretty sure. Or her family would <laughs> I don't help her. Your voice even shook when you said that. Yeah, because it's true. I don't like, believe in divorce, so I mean, what option do I have? We don't believe in divorce, we believe in murder. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so therefore, like, I don't like the alternative. And here's the thing I'm like stronger and could totally, you know, blah, 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 blah. You're not stronger than I she, Listen, she's, <laughs> she's the woman. Like, she can poison me. She can, like, kill me in my sleep. Like, <laughs> there's so many things. I'm like, hey, babe, help me out. I need to, uh, I need to change. I'm going to change my oil. Uh, put it in gear. Like, there's so many ways. She's, and women really? are. Really? I can put it in gear. For the most part. Take the car jack and just. Exactly. <laughs> there's like a mil- it's like that show a thousand ways to die. It's like a thousand, a thousand ways, ways to kill your wife can kill a you. little bit of patience. Starts putting tape on and spaghetti. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they just grow to the point where it's like, and me, I wouldn't go into hospital to the doctor. I would totally kill me. So, anyways, that idea, just like now we're going up all these ways that she'd be murdering me. Like that relationship wouldn't last. Like I couldn't get away with that. Same thing with God. We can't come to church for a while and be really good and. Do some cool stuff and be involved in human videos. By the way, we need you in human video if you're under 18. Um, we need you in the human video. We need a few more people. I think. I know, you're, you're yeah. confirmed, so good. Same thing, we can't do that. Like, Nineveh was eventually struck down. They were like decimated. Like, historically speaking, there's only a few cities that were like just sacked as much as they were. It, it's like they didn't lose the game. Would be one of them. It's like they didn't lose the game. Their quarterback died in the game like it was bad uh and for a long time people just they were gone so we can move out of that like we we have to keep that going we we can't just say some prayers and just keep going we have to daily the bible talks about living in the spirit um we have to follow the promptings of the holy spirit which means we have to be filled and led by the holy spirit we have to know what the word says which means we have to read it because we can just glaze over a scripture and be like, oh yeah, I don't worship Baal, so I'm good. But if we had studied and we were like, oh wait, yeah, there's other ways like, oh wow, I, I, and the Holy Spirit brings something in your mind right there. Like, I need to change this. And it's a constant thing. It's not a, we've arrived. We haven't arrived until you're dead and you're in heaven and you've actually arrived. So it's, it's an ongoing, just like a relationship. It's not a duty. It's not something you check off the box. Just like a relationship that you have to keep going and just like we have to eat, stay alive, we have to constantly be doing things to feed ourselves spiritually and keep the relationship going. So with that, let's uh, bow our heads. We'll close in prayer, and then we will get out of here. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you will move on our hearts and minds, even after we leave here. That uh, each, and You know each and every one of us. You know what we need, what things we're struggling with, what points... Uh, hit a nerve, just convict us, show us the things that we need to change, uh, build us up and encourage us in the things we're doing well at and need to continue in. And Lord, just show us what we need to do, whether that's we need to talk to someone and, and confess our sin and get some help with something we're struggling with, whether that's making something right and restoring something wrong that we've done and fixing a situation and going back, whether that's dropping an activity of getting, just making a change, whatever it is, Lord God. I pray that um, you show that clearly to each of us here what that thing is for us that is hindering our relationship with you and, and keeping us from moving forward. And just, just like every week, I just pray that you help us to have a desire and a hunger for you that grows. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.